Hello, my friend. Time for the next episode in the Red Delta Project podcast and live feed Q&A. Today's episode is brought to you by one of the most effective, reliable, and safe weight loss and performance enhancing drugs. Yes, I'm talking to today about this magical thing called caffeine. It's basically one of the most widespread used ways in order to improve your performance, help you build muscle by improving said performance in the gym, and of course, decreasing appetite, increasing metabolic output, and so on. So ask your doctor if caffeine, of course, is right for you. And you don't need to make it anything fancy, like any special supplements, any sort of like energy drinks or something, coffee, tea, and so on is perfectly good to fit the bill. And of course, by the new Grand Style Calisthenics Workout Program, this month's uh, full uh, program is available. Link down below. That's a month one, month two, three, and now four is out. This month's program helps you focus on particularly some of those hard to target muscle groups in calisthenics, particularly the muscles in the chest and the lats with a couple of quirks and tweaks on very classic push and pull variations. So check out month one number uh, down below in the description. And of course, month four is also available on the Red Delta Project YouTube channel in the Grind Style Calisthenics playlist. So today's episode is a special one. This one is a weekend edition because I couldn't unfortunately get to the usual one that I do on Wednesday. So thank you very much for being flexible and joining me here today. But I wanted to kind of pull back the curtain a little bit and remove some of this idea out there. I think there's this this message out there that fitness coaches and people you see on social media have like no regrets about what they did. Like they automatically were doing everything right out of the box. And there's all those memes I see sometimes on social media of like, I regret that workout, said no one ever and all these sorts of things. But the fact is, I look back on my training career, which started over 20 years ago, and I think, you know, in all honesty, most of it I would do differently if I had to do it all over again. I wouldn't do at least three quarters of it the same way I did. Lots of regrets, lots of mistakes were made, and I'm sure I'm still going to continue making them as I learn and grow throughout my further career for the, uh, the rest of my life. But I wanted to share some of these with you because maybe you can learn from the example or it's just a fun way for me to kind of be like, yep, I was an idiot. I was a complete fool for doing these things. The, the funny thing is you never know it's like a mistake in the time that you're making it, only in hindsight, you know, hindsight 2020 is so to speak. So let's get in. Number one is the idea that I had to mercilessly drive myself and force myself to do things that I didn't want to do in order to get results. This is kind of a blanket attitude that I used to have, but it was one of these ideas like if it was hard and it made me suffer, blood, sweat, and tears, then it was probably a step in the right direction and going to be worthwhile. And for the longest time, that was kind of my compass needle that I was making my decisions off of. Like, should I do X or should I do Y? Well, why sure as hell is a lot harder and it's probably going to be uncomfortable and I really don't want to do it. Okay, then that's the thing that I should be doing. But looking back, I realized that a lot of times the things that I didn't want to do, I honestly shouldn't have been doing <laughs> because there was a good reason not to be doing it. Just because it was harder and just because it made me more uncomfortable didn't mean it was actually more productive. Much of the time, I should have been listening to my body more and resting more or being more comfortable taking steps to make sure that my training was actually more productive and not just going off of that idea of, well, it's hard and it's making me suffer and it takes a lot of discipline to do it. Therefore, it must be the most effective way to go about it as opposed to really knowing what I'm doing and saying, no, you are only doing it the hard way because you don't know what you're doing. And that's a very low bar to clear is you're just, your strategy is to just basically make yourself suffer. And that just compounded a lot of stress, mind, body, lifestyle, and so on. And that's why I also suffered quite a bit of injuries and lifestyle and uh, fitness burnout as well. I was always kind of taking off and then crashing, taking off and crashing because my whole strategy was just do things the hard way, just really make yourself work hard. And that was all I was doing. So if I had to go back and do it again, I would say, no, learn how to properly train and focus on how to do productive training, not just hard training. Is just because it's harder doesn't mean it's more effective. And that's the second thing that I regret is that not knowing what particular outputs or stimuli I needed to create in my training. 
because when I was going with, well, it's just hard, and if I don't want to do it, then that for sure means that I should be doing it, I was not only turning my attention towards what didn't really require uh, being done to get results, but I was also turning my attention away from the things that did matter. Like, are you using your body better? Are you getting better at doing the exercise? Are you improving how well you can do the bike racing, the Taekwondo, the exercises? I didn't have enough of a focus on the quality of what I was doing. I was just trying to drive myself into the ground. And I could have had the worst technique. I could have the sloppiest form. And I could have been doing like three quarters of my workouts were useless. Like doing the exercises just for the sake that they're hard and doing them in a way that it's like, well, I'm going to be suffering more if I go for a bike ride in the hottest time of the day. That's going to be harder and it's going to be more difficult. So therefore, that's what I'm going to do. But I wasn't really focused on, well, how do you actually ride a bike better? How do I become a better cyclist? How do I make my workouts structured in such a way that I actually train myself to ride better as opposed to just be able to put up with uh, suffering? And that, of course, is dependent on the circumstance that you're doing, uh, you know, training for cycling different than training for pull-ups and stuff. But that's where I wish I had put more of my attitude and my attention is, okay, how do I learn how to do this exercise better? How do I learn? I guess it's the learning thing that wasn't really present there. Uh, funny enough, a lot of times relying too much on just hard work and how hard I can push myself was actually a very lazy approach because I didn't want to get in touch with coaches. I didn't want to read books. I didn't want to follow programs. I didn't want to learn how to do things better. I just wanted to take whatever I could do and drive myself into the ground mercilessly day after day in order to do that. So I regret not learning enough and just trying to work my way into the success that I was trying to achieve, smarter, not harder sort of idea. The third regret that I had was too much of a dependence or too much of a of focus on exercising purely for the sake of like burning fat and calories. I don't know why, but I had my mindset focused on like this idea that if left untrained and you're not working your body to exhaustion every single day, that the body's just going to naturally and automatically start building up a lot of body fat uh, for some reason. Like it's just this automatic thing that happens. And I had to just drive myself into the ground every day with as much exercise as I could possibly stand in order to stay lean. And it's funny because that's a complete reversal from where I am now, where it's like, I don't do anything whatsoever about trying to just burn calories. Like, I don't care how much, uh, how many calories I burn. I don't care about uh, exercising for weight loss. I don't do any sort of physical activity whatsoever for the sake of this is going to burn a lot of calories or help me stay lean. It's the furthest thing from my mind. But back in the day, that was the majority of what my decisions were based off of. Once again, circling back to, well, if it's hard, that means I'm burning a lot of fat and calories. Therefore, it's helping me stay lean. And if I don't do super hard things and exhaust myself all the time, then those calories are just going to turn to fat and I'm just going to start building up body fat reserves and I'm going to get fatter and fatter unless I'm exhausting myself every single day. But the fact is I'd go back to my old self back in college and be like, dude, you don't have to do anything in order to stay lean. Because of course the other half of the equation is diet. Like if you have a caloric balance, your weight's going to be stable even if you're a complete couch potato even if you're barely doing any exercise at all, you don't need to exercise in order to be lean or stay lean. So that's why I always give people this advice. Like imagine if your weight could stay stable and level without ever having to exercise whatsoever for the sake of weight maintenance. How would you change your workout program? What type of training would you dump? What kind of training would you further adapt? How would you change things around? Whatever those answers are, that's what you probably should be doing anyways. Because on one side of the coin, there's no such thing as weight loss exercise. There's no type of training or exercise that directly makes your body get leaner or stay lean. And I really wish I knew that back in the day because I, at the time I thought I was doing everything for the sake of getting and staying lean. But the reason why that works is because nothing directly tells you to burn fat and calories because everything burns fat and calories. Every type of physical activity that you do 
burns calories. It's kind of like there's no such thing as a specific way to burn fat and calories any more than there's a specific road you should drive on in order to burn gas. Drive anywhere, you'll burn gas. Do anything, you'll burn fat and calories. And I wish I knew that back then because I would have saved myself so much time and energy without the cardio, without the stuff of like, I gotta burn those calories, that's why I gotta exercise. No, you don't. You don't have to burn it because I was also caught in that cardio trap of I'm burning a lot of calories every single day and then when I would go to, particularly in college, like the, the student uh, cafeteria, I would just eat like crazy because I was eating a lot because I was training a lot. And I was training a lot because I was eating a lot. And it was just this exhausting daily cycle where time and energy was spent every day. And I thought I had to do that to stay lean when I wish I could go back in time and say, Matt, forget about it. Like train to condition your body. Go for bike rides because you want to be a better bike racer, not because you want to burn calories. Go and do Taekwondo because you want to be a martial artist, not because you're going to burn calories. Take the whole calorie thing completely out of the equation. Like it's not even a, a factor to even think about. And then adjust your diet accordingly to support your physical activity rather than trying to do exercise to support your eating habits. The other regret that I have is relying too much on a singular variable or influence in my training as a measure of what constituted an effective workout. So I see this all the time where people will say, okay, my goal is to do an hour of cardio. That was one of the things that I had. I do an hour of cardio. Sometimes people are like, I have to work up a sweat or I have to burn a certain number of calories or I have to follow three sets of 10 or do a hundred pushups, whatever the case may be. I always had one single thing that would constitute what was a good workout. And if heaven forbid, I couldn't do that one thing, like I couldn't do an hour of cardio, or I couldn't do 500 push-ups a day or whatever, I could do 480 push-ups, it was a complete failure. And I'd go to bed, and I'm like, I'm a complete loser, a failure that today didn't work at all because I only got 45 minutes of cardio in at the gym or whatever because I closed early and stuff. This was a big mistake on me because there's no single one thing that determines the value of your workouts. Your workout isn't automatically effective because you constitute a certain amount of time or reps or uh, whatever you're, you're using. That doesn't mean it doesn't matter, right? The duration you work out is important. The amount of repetition you do is important and so on, but it's just one piece of the puzzle. There's a lot more other things you should be considering. And as a result, I was so focused on that one thing and ignoring 95% of everything else that should have been put uh, uh, placing my attention on that was actually determining the bulk of my success. It was kind of like uh, in sports saying like, just focus on that one player, the rest of the team doesn't matter. So I wish I could go back and have more of a diversified perspective on the variables in my workouts and saying, okay, the amount of cardio you do or how long you ride your bike, that's great, but what's your pace? What's your cadence? What's your wattage? What's your FTP? Are you improving your time in this area? Are you improving your breathing? How's your technique? How's your pedal? Like there's a million other things I would tell myself to go and look for because that was actually probably more important for my performance rather than ding, good time's up. I worked out for an hour. That means my workout was effective when in reality it probably wasn't because I was totally blind in the things that were more important. And my last regret that I had when it came to my workouts is too much of a dependence on external uh, influences, but I would say more of equipment. Uh, this was especially when I got my start in fitness. I didn't start being a coach or a fitness trainer. I started with fitness equipment. I built and sold and repaired, uh, set up home gyms and stuff. And I was very much focused on, okay, if you want to build up this muscle, you need this kind of equipment. Or if you want this result, you need this kind of equipment or this type of exercise. Uh, like if I was always thinking to myself, you can't possibly build up a, a decent set of chest muscles unless you have an incline bench, decline bench, flat bench with at least six different adjustments. You have a full set of flies, you also have a cable crossover machine, a pec deck machine. Like I had this full list of things that I needed to use every single workout in order to build up my chest. And it's funny how things now turn the ties. Like, dude, I just need a floor and that's all I need kind of thing. It'd be great if I had like a dip bar or something, but you know, don't need to be too picky about it. And this is the thing that it's not so much the dependence on the equipment, but it's more of the attitude 
of I need, to, in order for me to get what I want and be successful, I need something external to me to bring me what I need. I need to rely on a gym. I need to rely on a piece of equipment. I need to rely on a supplement or a person or something. Give me what I need. Here I am. I want this. Therefore, bring it to me. When I should have had it the opposite way of what can I bring to what I'm doing to get the results I want? What can I bring to my coach in order to have a good word? What can I bring to the gym, to the push-up, to the cable crossover? Because it's more about what you bring to those resources than what the resources bring to you that's really ultimately going to determine whether or not you get the results that you want. Of course, it's cyclical. I bring something to my coach, my coach gives me advice, and it's a cyclical thing. But the thing that is often missing in, I uh, see from many individuals who are too dependent, it's like, what kind of diet's gonna make me lose weight? What kind of exercise will build up my lats or my chest? And it's like, whatever uses your lats has the potential to, but it depends more on you than your exercise, than the workout, than whether or not you have a narrow grip or a wide grip lat pull down and stuff. That stuff is just small little influences that it's not that they're not important, but they're not ultimately going to determine your fate. What you put into your training is ultimately what's more important as opposed to what you can ask for from it. And uh, I wish I really had that back in the day. So those are my top training regrets, things that I would have changed over the course of my training career. I mean, all through high school, college, just after college and stuff that I really wish I could go back because I would have changed probably most everything I'd ever done when it comes to working out and fitness. And uh, my life would have been a hell of a lot easier. And I probably would have gotten a lot further as well, probably avoided some injuries as well. All right, let's get to some questions here. Right on off the pot. Dreamer coming up, sup Matt? What's your take on doing dead hangs for bigger and stronger forearms? Also on a side note, do you think push-up training forearms uh, push-up training can train your forearms effectively. Believe it or not, yeah, the push-up or anything where you're pushing your hands into the floor can get your forearms more than people realize. Uh, is you'll probably feel this more if you do any sort of like handstand training or anything where there's a stability component to it, like the the crow stands or the frog stands in yoga or stage. I think it's two in convict conditioning for the handstand format because you use your forearms for a lot of stability. As you're pressing your fingers into the floor, really gets those forearm extensors. Uh, but uh, generally, for the most part, I'm not a big fan of just dead hangs in general, not because I think they're bad or dangerous or anything, because you hear that all the time on the internet. It's like, they're bad for you. Screw that. You know, the biggest reason why I'm not a big fan of dead hangs is just no tension in the muscle. You're relaxed. The whole point of training is to turn on and use your muscles. So you're not using them. So you're missing out. <laughs> you're, you're, and now I know, yeah, you're hanging and you're getting your forearms but your forearms are gonna work better and stronger if you keep tension in the rest of your pull chain. So you get your forearms and your biceps and your shoulders and your lats and your traps, get everything engaged. And that doesn't mean you need to be like halfway up on the pull-up bar. You can still have a ever so slight kink. You're still hanging down, but keeping tension in the rest of your pull chain will not only just bring more benefit from the exercise, because hey, who doesn't like working their biceps more, but it also ensures that your forearms are going to be working all that much better as well. And again, I know a lot of people who are like, dead hangs are great, they're only pussies don't do dead hangs. Again, that's the, the attitude I used to have of, well, it's harder, therefore it must be better. But just because it's harder doesn't mean it's beneficial. We don't want to judge the validity and the value of an exercise or a workout based on how much effort it requires to do it. Because it's certainly possible to put in a lot of effort to something and get very little value out of it. Especially if we don't know particularly what kind of stimuli you're trying to generate. And when you know what kind of stimuli you're trying to generate or how you're trying to train your body, a lot of the stuff that's really hard and stuff loses a ton of value because you realize eh, it's hard, but big deal. Like, why do it that way? We want to make sure it's the right kind of hard, not just hard for its own sake. 
Sorry about skipping around the questions here, folks. Thank you so much for coming on. Let me know too, if this weekend time is good for you. I, I'm sorry that I'm moving around the schedule on stuff. My work schedule uh, through the gym that I work at has been all kinds of helter skelter. So even my own like training workout schedule and stuff is all over the place. I have very little stability in my life these days. So I sincerely appreciate you folks being flexible and coming on and uh, being able to uh, accommodate it really means a lot to me far far on coming on hi what do you think about wide push-ups does it target more in the chest for a full development what do you think push-up and knuckles in general i like knuckle push-ups of course the martial artist in me did you know those for years i i just also like the fact that you can train a neutral wrist there's a lot of stability going on in there good strong wrist weak wrists are a very big problem in uh, our fitness culture in general because we're usually grabbing onto nice handles and stuff and as a result your wrist is kind of a weak link and in the martial arts it's a bit more of an issue but you could have your torso and arm muscles super strong but if you have weakness on the end that's kind of like shooting an arrow with a cream puff on the end of it instead of a nice razor sharp broadhead point all right it's just gonna blah so you want to have strength through to your very fingertips so doing them on the knuckles helps with that as well Personally though, I'm not a big fan of doing almost anything wide. And that I fully admit is a little bit prejudice on my mind because I used to do a lot of stuff wide. My right shoulder is really wonky and it gets really not happy with me anytime I'm doing stuff wide. So put a little asterisk in that, know where I'm coming from with that. Because a lot of times when fitness coaches like me, we give advice, it's tainted by our own perspective. And it's like, it's the worst thing for you. It's like, no, it was bad for you. It doesn't mean it's bad in general. So that's the way wide pushups would be, is it's a tool that could be used. But in general, I almost always keep things real close and narrow. One, because I think it's just more beneficial. Uh, two, you're going to get more stability. Three, it trains your stability and your joints and everything for more progressive push-ups. Four, no, it doesn't necessarily work the chest more. Remember, the ability to work muscles is more from your focus and concentration than the exercise itself. You know, we want to be aware of that idea of, well, I do the exercise this way and I feel it in certain muscles. And then I do it this other way and I feel it in different muscles. The question we should be asking ourselves is, why are you changing that? Yeah, I, I kind of, a, as a a jerk, you know, as a, as a coach, I'll do this with clients sometimes, only if I'm good friends with the clients, and I'll have them do different grips and stuff. And I'm like, why? Okay, what's different? Like, I feel it more in my lats this way. I feel it more in my, you know, shoulders this way. I'm like, why are you changing it? Why are you not using your lats enough on that variant? It's like, okay, on that variant, use your lats more. On that one, you don't use your lats as much. Why are you turning off your lats? Again, don't rely on the exercise. You want your lats to work. You want your biceps to work, work them, turn them on. It's your responsibility to ensure that the muscles are doing what you want them to do, not the exercise. The exercise is an influence, yes. It changes the flavor of the exercise, but it shouldn't determine and control your muscle tension. That's your job, that's what you should be doing. And I really wish I knew that back in the day because it also gives you much more consistency in your workouts too. Because when I was working at the equipment shop, man, you would see me every morning, I'd be like, okay, this machine press feels better in the chest and this one's better in the triceps, okay. So I want that machine for my chest. And then like three days later, I'd be like, no, 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 this one's better for the chest, that one for the tricep, no. No, wait, hold on, why would that, would you? and it was all over the place. But when I started to realize, you want your chest to work? Turn on your chest and keep it on for whatever variant you're doing, great. like great, now everything works the chest great. Whatever the exercise is, whatever the technique is, it all works the chest wonderfully. And you get much more control over the effectiveness and the consistency of your training. So anyway, little, little tangent there, thank you so much for the questions. Let me see if I can get to some of these back ones here. Kid Elegant, is a personal coach for the first two or three months be a good idea to get into it? Uh, yeah, for the most part. Don't uh, be, the, the, the thing is we want experience. If you're ever looking at the validity or the value of a coach, uh, people ask me like, if I'm looking for a coach or a trainer, what should I ask? One, don't automatically assume if they've got like 50 years of experience, they're a good coach. I've known several coaches who are, you know, very, they've got a long track record, but it's not a good track record. You know what I'm saying? Uh, here's what I would do is ask a coach or ask yourself if you're a coach, 
and say, okay, what have you changed in your approach over the past several months or a couple of years? A good coach should give you an answer of, oh, I used to do X, but now we do X with a little bit of a twist, or now we're going a little more in this direction, or now we're making these little changes. That's what you want. It's not about how much time is someone a coach. It's not about experience, what your track record is so much. Those are good things to assess, but are you learning? Are you continuing to grow and develop? That's the thing that's the most important is how well are you improving and progressing over time? Because there are coaches out there who are really good, have been in this game for like six months, but they have a lot of history with other things and they're good learners. And other coaches, they've been doing this for 20 years and they're like, yep, I do my workouts and I train people the same way now as 10 years ago. That's not a good sign. What's the old saying? Like, if you don't look back five years from now and realize what an idiot you were, you're probably still an idiot. That's kind of the way we want to be approaching our sort of training. And that, like I'm saying with these regrets, you want to look back and be like, oh man, I can't believe I did things that way. Or can you believe I believe that and stuff? And that's the same thing now. You should look back on this time in your training career five years from now, be like, whoa, okay, I, I regret doing that. And oh, that wasn't the best way to do that and stuff because it shows you're learning. It shows you're growing. And if you can't do that, it shows you're stagnant. And stagnation is really what we want to be afraid of. Let's see what else we got here. Kid Elegant, sorry, I uh, hit the wrong one there again. Uh, hi, what do you have advice on a guy like me starting to work out? I feel like when I start, I probably do things the wrong way, even though I can watch videos on how to do it. Oh, this is such a good question. Very, very good. So here's the thing is when we're starting out, we're oftentimes consumed with this idea of doing things wrong. And make no mistake, no matter what you do and no matter how you do it, you're gonna look back and wish you did it differently, or at least you should. Because again, like I said, if you don't look back and wish you did it differently, that means you're still doing things the same way. But don't worry too much about getting things quote unquote wrong, because there's a lot of range of acceptable behavior that can still move you forward, especially as a beginner. As a guy who's been working out for over 20 years, I look back on my beginner stages and be like, yeah, there's a lot of mistakes I made. But when you're a beginner, you could practically do anything and probably move forward with it. You can make progress doing almost anything at all. And that's what I did. Like I did probably 90% of everything, quote unquote, wrong or ways I wish I didn't do it. And I still made a lot of progress relatively quickly and easily when I was a beginner because you're a blank sheet of paper Whatever you do is going to be a step forward because you're going from nothing to something. Even if that something's not the best, it's still moving forward. When you have more experience, that's when you've got to be a little bit more critical about what you're doing because you can lose ground. But as a beginner, you don't have a lot of ground to lose. With the caveat that I would say, pay attention to your body and don't do things that are basically harming you. So that whole idea that I had of stress and hardship and suffering was the way to go. I was ignoring pain. I was ignoring exhaustion. I was ignoring burnout. I thought the worse off I felt, the better I was supposedly doing. I just kept driving myself further in the ground. So as a beginner, that's the only thing I would say is look for is don't ignore pain. Don't ignore those signs of burnout and stuff like that. And just keep learning because it's the learning that's going to save you. The biggest mistake you make as a beginner is saying, I want to get it right. And then somehow you fall into a dogmatic approach of the right way to eat, the right way to do a push up, the right way to do a squat. And I don't care how right it is. The problem is you're now stuck. You're going to do things the same way forever. And that's worse than doing it wrong because wrong is going to be like, Oh, no, ow, that hurt my knee. Okay. That's wrong. You learn real quick. Don't do it that way. But getting stuck means that you're not going to get better for years and years and years and years. And you can work your ass off for your entire life and go nowhere. I would rather go backwards than stay stuck because at least when you go backwards, you learn quickly. Oh, that's not working for me. Okay. Don't do that. I just learned something. I'm going to try something else. At least something's changing. But when you stay stuck, you can just be going around in circles forever. And that's the thing you want to be the most aware of is staying stuck like that. But the good news is as a beginner, you can literally do almost anything and you're going to keep that needle moving forward. Fantastic. Joe Janusk, hope I pronounced that right there, Joe. Hey, Matt, 
do I really need to keep my elbows so close to my sides uh, that they scrape my sides when doing push-ups, pull-downs, rows, and so on? I feel like I get better muscle activation if I have a small gap. Yeah, I mean, everybody's a little bit different, so by all means, experiment. You know, by all, and that's the thing is experiment and see what kind of works better for you. Now, it's not necessarily a set in stone thing of like, okay, if I do it this way, I get this result. That's the way it's always going to be. I remember there was a time where doing close push-ups didn't work my chest at all. Now it's the easiest, best way for me to work my chest. I get down on the ground, I'm doing narrow. That is chest city. So it's something that's always going to change and evolve. So always be adjusting things. But by all means, listen to your body and your feedback. If you get a little bit of a gap and you're doing things you're like, okay, that feels better, then go with that. But again, go back to the idea of why am I doing it better there? Why is my muscle activation better there than closer to the sides? And try to whittle that gap closed because theoretically, you should do any sort of pushing movement and it'll feel the same in your chest. Any type of technique, anything should be roughly the same. Of course, there's always going to be some difference there, but that difference should be smaller, 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 smaller. I'm now at the point where anytime I put my hands on the floor, no matter what I'm doing, my chest turns on. And that's what we want to have is not to have that narrow range of ability where I only feel my chest if I do this one type of exercise, this one specific way. You want to be using your muscles in a very effective way for everything. And that's why oftentimes when people have trouble with a muscle activation, I'll tell them the sign that you're on the right track is you're using your muscles more in everything. Like we, if glutes and hamstrings are a good example, like, ah, oh, I don't feel my glutes and hamstrings. So I'll give them something like an isometric bridge or something You're like, okay, I feel them working now. It's like, okay, you feel it working like that. That's how they should feel all the time. When you're walking, when you're running, when you're getting up off the toilet, out of a chair, out of your car, your glutes should feel like that. And of course they're like, but that's not the case. I'm like, that's what we got to work on because you want to have better neuromuscular proficiency, which means you're using your muscles better with everything not just a narrow range of training parameters and conditions. All right, let's keep on going. Al Painter's in the house. Always good to talk to you, Al, by all means. And everybody check out our latest podcast, the Fit at Home podcast. In your latest podcast directory, we're having a lot of fun uh, with that, all on practical tips on how to stay in shape at home. There's my plug for that. But anyway, hey, how's it going, Al? Hey, Matt, what are your thoughts on this? I have better scapular motion when rowing with a low below the knees orientation than I do with high ones. What do you think is going on? Yeah, very, very common. So the latest edition of the grind style calisthenics program has low lat rows being done on it for exactly this reason. And the uh, occurrence that's probably happening is when our hands go up, our shoulder blades typically go up and it doesn't take much, just even a few millimeters of elevation or protraction with our shoulders can be enough to significantly change your ability to activate and engage some of the muscles in your back. So generally, when we're doing particularly rows, you wanna pack those shoulders down and back pretty tight, or at least having the control to pack them on every repetition. That's gonna improve your activation. And I would bet anything when your hands and stuff are moving up, your shoulder blades are moving up and they're not getting packed enough at the end of it. And that's compromising your stability, less stability, less tension control and activation in your, uh, in your back. Steven Jagger. Hey Matt, how would you work with a client who wants to lose five to 10 kilograms? Very good question. So general weight loss questions here, uh, sort of thing. So the first thing is whenever you're working with someone, you've got to start with where they are. It's like a GPS, right? You, you don't get on your GPS and you, you say, hey, Google, take me to the airport. And it says, okay, turn left. No, of course, your, your GPS needs to be like, okay, so where are you? <laughs> I need to know where you are in order to give you directions. This is one of the biggest mistakes that us coaches make is we're like, oh, you want to lose weight? Okay, here we go. So here's my favorite diet and here's my favorite workout program. And here's the thing. And the research says this and the research says that and blah, blah, blah. And you're not taking any consideration into where they actually are. You could be like, okay, I want you working out cardio every single day. And they'd be like, um, I've got a broken leg. Uh, no <laughs> kind of thing. And we coaches love to criticize people for this too. It's like, oh, I was working with this client, but she wouldn't stick to my diet. She wouldn't stick to my workout program. And she refused to do this exercise or whatever. If you have a client who's not compliant, it's not the client. 
your program sucks. <laughs> it's like, no, the research says this and it's gotten results for all these people. Doesn't matter, right? The client is coming to you because you're supposed to fit whatever you're working with to the client in their current state. So if they come to you and you're like, I don't want to give up chocolate, I hate cardio, and I like to sleep in until noon, you got to make that work. It's your responsibility as a coach to somehow at least get the ball rolling. Yeah, maybe it's not ideal. Maybe they can't get to where they want with their current thing, but you've got to get them at least moving from their current situation. So that's your first step is what is your current diet like? What is your current activity level like? And get a general lifestyle scenario. I mean, maybe they work third shift and they, they sleep all day kind of thing. Got to get a, a handle on where they are. Then ask them, what are some of the best things that you can do right now to decrease caloric intake or change the diet or get more action? Always let them make their suggestions. Because if you say, okay, eat this way and do this and stuff, they're taking orders. Nine times out of 10, they know better than you do what they should be doing. Because they know their life, they know their diet, they know their workouts. Because we all know, like if you sit us down and you're like, okay, so what can you do to improve things? We know. Like, come on, we know, we, we know we should be getting to bed sooner. We know we shouldn't be drinking a six pack of beer every night. We know what we need to do. So that's what you need to do. Second of all is like, okay, so what are the biggest things you need to do? Then once they're like, okay, I need to drink less. I need to not eat a loaf of bread for breakfast every morning kind of thing. It's like, okay, so these are the things you need, know you need to do. How successful are you in consistently doing these things? Of course, they'll be like, mm, not so good. That's your job get them over those obstacles. They've got an obstacle that's preventing them from doing the thing they know they should be doing. That's your job is getting them over that obstacle. Okay, so you hate going to the gym to work out. That's why you're not consistently moving very much. So let's find a way to move without the gym. Oh, we can do that? Yes, we can, absolutely. And you just keep asking them questions. How do you feel about this? Give me, and all you gotta do is one thing a week and say, okay, so from an exercise standpoint, what can we do with this? Get them excited, let them take a little bit of control, you're just giving them ideas. And then you're off to the races. You're, they're taking control, they're saying, I can do X, that's definitely something I can do. And then we'll say, okay, we'll try that for a week and see how it goes. And by all means, you want them having things that seem like, yeah, I could definitely do that. If you make a suggestion like, okay, no more alcohol, they're like, okay, I guess I can maybe do that. No, that's not going to work. Maybe for a little bit, but you want them to take um, action with things that are like, oh, I could definitely do that. Oh yeah, that, that that's something I can certainly do. Now you're on to a winning formula. Questions are coming in fast and furious here, folks. Thank you so much with everybody. Let's go right on here. My obstacle is being a virgin <laughs> Will a coach help with that? Believe it or not, I'm sure there are coaches that can help with that. And this is the thing about life. It, it, uh, we all need a coach. We all need coaches to get around things. It's not just for fitness. I mean, me personally, like I need financial coaches, financial advisors. That's one of the biggest things I've done over the past year is like, I literally have no head for numbers. This tax season was ugly for me, really bad. So finally, I enlisted some help. Some people need fashion help. Again, another thing I need. You know, for me, I wear the same outfit seven days a week. And my friends are like, you're going out in that? I'm like, what? What's wrong with this? And they're like, okay, sure, kind of thing. I have no sense of style whatsoever. So believe me, if I wanted to take my style a little more seriously, I'm hiring a coach. Because you don't know what you don't know. And there are dating coaches. There are relationship coaches. You know, you go and you try and meet people and stuff. You just don't know what you don't know. So you need someone to look and see what you're doing. And then they're like, okay, this is how you're standing. This is how you're talking. This is what you're doing. Let's make these changes here. Can you do that? Yes, good. Boom. And you're on your way. You're making some sort of improvement. You can prove anything in life with a good coach. And uh, we all need it more than we realize. There, the internet's created too much of this idea out there of we can figure it out for ourselves that we can solve our problems with a YouTube video or an infographic or some little buzz social media post or something. No, life is not that simple. Oftentimes we need someone to look at what we're doing to give us actual practical advice we really need. And you're just not going to get that with you know a five minute YouTube video. 
Michael in the house, how's it going? Hi, Matt. What would you recommend for back training when having access to lightweight dumbbells and barbell only and without including pull-ups due to rotator cuff injury? All right, so very good question. So first and foremost, I would go with uh, the two exercises uh, that I would focus on are rear flies and shoulder extensions where you're straight arm and coming back that's going to cover your back to a very large degree, but you're using leverage to add resistance with the weights, okay? So a lot of times pull-ups, rows, and stuff like that, they're leverage-wise, they're easy exercises. So we need a lot of weight or a lot of external resistance in order to adequately work the back. But when the arms go straight, and again, I know I'm contradicting myself from what I said earlier, I do everything close, this is an exception. Uh, when we go with a straight fly, okay, there's your traps and your rhomboids and everything. And I mean straight, like stretch your arms out as long as you possibly can. And even with that alone, a lot of people will get a decent amount of work in their back just with the weight of their arms. You know, that's why sometimes you'll, you'll see people like lift heavy books or something. It doesn't take much. And then the, the bent over straight arm extensions, that's shoulder extensions. So rows, pull-ups and stuff that's working your back, especially your lats, through shoulder extension. So you're getting the same motion, so you're still working the same muscles, or at least you should be, because you're not really fundamentally doing anything different, but now you're doing a straight arm, so you're losing leverage to get the resistance instead of relying on the heavier weights. And you can do it however you like, of course, you know, your rear flies, then you're straight, or you can alternate between the two, because you're in the same position for both, probably about the same amount of weight for either of those. And then, of course, you can go with uh, curls, to round it out and getting in your biceps and your pull chain. Fantastic questions. Flow into Freedom says, happy Easter, everyone. Thank you very much. You know, Easter is always one of those holidays. I grew up in a Catholic household and stuff. It always sneaks up on me. When I was in Japan uh, studying abroad, we got up one morning and we were like, okay, what do we got going on today? And my study group and everything, we're going to church. And I'm like, church, really? Um, okay, why? And they're like, well, it is Easter. I'm like. It is <laughs> like I had no idea. It always sneaks up on me. I'm like, oh, how, how, how easily I forget these sorts of things. Oops, sorry, Steve. I already got that one. I'm going through questions here. Sorry if I miss anything. By all means, folks, if I miss your question and it's just kind of going up the feed, post it again. And uh, that way I can make sure I uh, get into uh, what you want. I do try to answer these as well as possible. Uh, Tony asked, what do you think about the tibialis anterior exercises? I feel like even with body weight, uh, tib raises, my legs are becoming bigger and calves more defined. Absolutely. Yeah. It doesn't take much. Those are small muscles. Uh, the muscles in the shin, particularly they're small muscles. They have an important role to play, but they don't handle the load of the body, uh, like the calf muscles do and the calf muscles, much bigger, much more, uh, the leverage of their insertion points and stuff is much, much higher. So things that don't have to be very complicated with this, with runners and stuff, I'll usually have them just do like a simple duck walk where you're on your heels and you pull those toes up. And that's kind of an overcoming isometric where you're working against uh, the mobility of your ankle. And it's a very good exercise because you're working the strength of those exercises. You're working the stability in your hip because you're only working on, walking on your heels, but you're also working on the mobility of your ankle too, because you're flexing your ankle as much as you can. So that's usually the way I recommend just going about it is uh, just walk around on your heels, pulling your toes up as high as you possibly can. Of course, don't do things that are causing any sort of pain or cramping. Give it like 30 seconds and then you go into some calf raises and then you do your tibialis walk and then your calf raises and stuff back and forth a couple times done doesn't require much more beyond that hey hey look at this felix is in the house hey matt what are some other sorry what are some other training aha moments that have helped improve your martial arts performance oh that's very good well funny enough like i was saying earlier um getting over that whole exercise for the sake of calorie burn was huge because what that may meant was I always thought I had to do exercise for the sake of burning calories. Like I was always working against this never ending encroachment of threat. But once I realized I didn't need to do that anymore, then I could start to train for the value of the training itself. 
Like I wasn't going to Taekwondo for the sake of working out. Cause that was one of the biggest things that really held me back for years was I would go and some classes just weren't hard. And we'd be sitting and doing a, and my instructor would give a lecture on free sparring strategy or, or something. And so some classes just didn't have a lot of physiological uh, effort into it. And I always hated that. And that's one of the reasons why when I got into college and I discovered a thing called a gaim where I could work my ass off into the ground like crazy. I loved that because now I didn't have to rely on the class to work me hard enough. But when I realized I didn't have to work hard and drive myself in the ground, get hot and sweaty and sore the next day in martial arts, I could do it for the pure joy of being a martial artist. That really put it in a whole new perspective of, okay, you don't have to do martial arts because I thought I always had to, like, I have to go to Taekwondo. I have to be a martial artist. I have to do this whether you want to or not. And that decreases motivation very quickly. But once I started to realize I can do this just purely for the fun of it, just because I like going and stuff, that was a big turning point. And people in class noticed it too, because I was oh, so serious in my training. Got to be so serious. When I would free spar, I'd be like, hur, hur, hur. and then I started to just have more fun with it. And I go into free spar and we just dance and we could going around and I, I'd like get kicked to a wall with my friend, like Ed Bruley was a big bruiser kind of guy throwing me around. I used to get all upset and mad and then I'm laughing it off and I'm like, man, oh dude, I'm going to feel that one tomorrow kind of thing. And everybody's like, you're happy. You're having fun with this training. You're enjoying the martial arts. And I think that's the most important thing we can do with any form of training is actually enjoying doing it for its own sake. It's not for some other reason because you have to do it. It's because I like this martial arts. I love this school. I like working with these people. And that just brought so much more fun and enjoyment to it. And that was probably my biggest aha moment was when I started to turn that corner. And uh, I really got much more out of it. My training improved too, because I wasn't so serious and uptight all the time. I could be relaxed and loose and stuff and just having fun. Super Seamster, good to see you again. I remember that screen names. Question, question, question. Hey, Matt, Oops, excuse me. Uh, your books are great, thank you very much. Do you have anything for lower back pain? I've tried, I've had it for months. Yes, uh, so lower back pain, one of the things that people miss about lower back pain, they're one of the biggest mistakes that people make with it is they think it's about the lower back. And they think I gotta strengthen my lower back. But the fact of the matter is, if you look at the anatomy of the human body and the musculature, it's not really a muscle group. Yeah, yeah, we've got the quadratus lumborum and the iliocostalis and stuff crosses over it. And you've got your spinal erectors. But fundamentally, the lower back's more like a joint rather than a muscle group. Okay? Now, I should put a little asterisk here, of course, and say, I'm assuming there's nothing with your back. Like you don't have a slip disc or something because that could always be a possibility and you should see someone for that. But a lot of times what ends up happening is people have stress going into their lower back and it's like any other joint. We have a lot of joint issues in our fitness culture because we have stress going into it. And when you have stress going into a joint, it's going to hurt and there's nothing you can possibly do to alleviate that. There's no amount of strength or stretching or mobility drills that is going to solve that. You could foam roll the hell out of it and get the, the vibrating massage gun out and everything, and that's gonna bring you some temporary relief, but it's not actually causing uh, addressing the real problem. And the real problem is you've got stress going into the joint. So what you need to do is get the other muscles above and below it working because our joints are incredibly strong. Your lower back can handle a ton of stress, Provided that stress isn't going into it, it's going through it. And it just again, in the martial arts, you hit a board. If it stops, your hand hurts. If your hand goes through it and it breaks the board, you barely feel a thing. It's the same thing with forces going through the body. So when we have a lot of lower back pain, we've got force going into the back, but it's not going away from it. So you typically need strength and activation in your glutes and hamstrings, so all the muscles below it, and in potentially your lats, and your spinal erectors, the muscles above it. So that way stress is going through your lower back. And also you probably have an anterior pelvic tilt, which is very common. Almost everybody has this to some degree. So you're pinching that lower back chronically throughout the day. So engaging your glutes and hamstrings more and getting your hips woken up as well as your lats and other muscles in the back. So shoulders are back. That's going to level out your pelvis. Stress will go through the back 
and it should hopefully alleviate that back issue. I really hope that helps. Uh, check out bridging uh, videos on Red Delta Project YouTube uh, for help because bridges are really good for that. Dreamer says, let's get to nutrition a bit. Fantastic, wonderful. It is what I studied in college after all. Do you think eating five bananas a day for bulking a bad idea health-wise? Boy, that's a lot of bananas, holy smokes. Um, whenever someone's like, I'm gonna eat like a million potatoes or something like that, I'm like, you know, you can't eat other things. Um, I've never really understood the bodybuilding approach where they're like, I'm bulking up, but I'm gonna have a very narrow selection of foods that I can eat. Like the whole chicken and rice thing. I went to a, uh, I worked at a gym very briefly in Massachusetts and uh, it was run by a guy who was a bodybuilder figure competitor and stuff. So whenever he put people on a diet, it'd be chicken and rice, chicken and rice, chicken and rice, right? And people were like, I'm so sick of chicken. I'm like, what the hell's wrong with fish? <laughs> like, what? you don't like pork, tofu, tempeh, beans, and like, there's a million ways you can get protein. Why are you selecting one thing? You're gonna get sick of it. Same thing here. That's what makes me think of this with bananas. I don't see a problem with, <laughs> with bananas. Like you're eating a lot of bananas, but I would say more variety is probably the way to go. So have a couple bananas, put them with some peanut butter, have just food in general. Uh, you don't need to have one thing that you're trying to bulk up your diet with. Probably going with multiple sources of food is going to give you more diversity, more of a range of nutritional spectrum. It's gonna be more tasty, more satisfying. It's gonna be a hell of a lot easier to eat a lot. Because generally, when it comes to eating, if you want to reduce your uh, caloric load and how much you're eating, limit your diet. Because it's hard to eat a lot when you're not allowing yourself many food options. So if you want to eat more, open up the food options. The more food options you give yourself, the easier it's going to be to eat a lot more. So hopefully that helps. All right. Darth Tesla, best screen name ever. So you show great hypertrophy gains in the 20 to 25 rep range. If done to muscle failure, well, what happens to the sets after the first? Reduce resistance to keep numbers of reps the same or do reduce reps? Oh, awesome question. Fantastic, Darth. Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, rep range, it's not so much about the rep range. It's about that fatigue you alluded to. And some people just find that they have better ability to drive a high degree of fatigue with different rep ranges for different muscle groups. The other day I was listening to a podcast and the guy was recommending uh, like 10 to 15 for the upper body, but 15 to 20 for the lower body, just because you can potentially fatigue your legs more with higher repetitions. It's a whole strategy there. So I would say, don't worry too much about the rep range. It's the fatigue you're going to have. And you're absolutely right. When you have that high level of fatigue, subsequent sets are going to decrease because, well, you're tired. Uh, you know, as people who are like, I'm on this German volume training, it's 10 sets of 10. The only way you're getting 10 sets of 10 is if you don't go to a high state of fatigue on the first half of those sets. So you get to 10, but you could have definitely have done 12, 15 or 20 repetitions. So I would say um, maybe decrease the weight a little bit but don't feel like you've got to match those reps because it's the fatigue that you're ultimately going for. So if you get like 25 on the first one and then 20 and then 18, okay, maybe on the next one you decrease it a little bit to get 18 again or so forth. What you're looking for though is don't have so much of a drop off. You don't want to be like 25 and then six. <laughs> if you go down that fast, yeah, decrease the weight a little bit on that one or the resistance or whatever. And that way you can keep at least in the ballpark of the repetitions. Fantastic. Well done, Darth. Hey, Matt, I don't have a pull-up bar. Oh, this is a common one here. Uh, pull-up bar, and I work out my pull workouts with an isoflow. Very good. I've got one of those myself. Of course, I did a review on that. I have been doing uneven pull-ups with it. Uh, have you uh, tried it and will uh, be a strength training for it to, to, to the pull-up bar? Absolutely. You're fundamentally still doing the same thing. Uh, same movement patterns, same muscle groups. Uh, I'm assuming you're still working with your body against gravity. You're still fundamentally doing roughly the same exact thing. So when you use different tools, like I use an ISO flow or rings or a straight pull apart, you're changing what I call the flavor of the exercise, but fundamentally you're not really changing what you're doing that much. So the result is pretty much about the same. I used to have this guy, who, every time I talked to him uh, in a session, he would always tell me about these improvements he did to his diet 
but his improvements was instead of eating chocolate ice cream, he'd eat vanilla ice cream. And instead of low uh, regular potato chips, it'd be like low sodium potato chips. And he'd be like, I'm sure I'm making progress. I'm like, you're still just eating junk food. You're still doing the same thing. You're just changing the flavor. So when we want to make real change, we've got to change what we're doing on the fundamental level and change how we're using our body as opposed to changing the flavor, in which case when it comes to the flavor, yeah, do whatever the hell you want. You want to keep using the ISO flow for uneven pull-ups, go for it. You don't even need the pull-up bar. Don't worry about it. If you don't like the pull-up bar, don't worry about it. You're still doing good pull-ups right there. Steven coming on. Matt, what is the best training tip and best nutrition uh, tip you have ever received? Um, oh boy, that's a, that's a good one. I've got a lot of them myself, but what's the best one I've ever received? Um, probably the best one that I ever had was uh, the idea of, you know, you have options. You've got a ton of different options. I've, way back in the day, um, before intermittent fasting was a big thing, like before anybody even knew what it was about, uh, there was a podcast uh, by ba Brad Pilon who created this book called Eat, Stop, Eat, which was one of the ways that intermittent fasting got a lot more popular and stuff is this book, Eat, Stop, Eat, was all about intermittent fasting. Very good podcast. And in <laughs> at the end, what one of his, he and his buddy were talking and they said, yeah, if you want to lose weight. And jokingly, they said, and the only way to lose weight is through intermittent fasting. And they laughed about it because, of course, it's not the only way. <laughs> of course, even they who were fans and proponents of fasting were recognizing in that moment of you don't have to do this. Like you don't need to do intermittent fasting. So the best tip I've ever kind of, it wasn't a, a straight tip, just a lesson I learned over time is you've got a lot of freedom and flexibility with your approach to diet. There's almost nothing you have to do. Sure, if you have a peanut allergy, you can't eat peanuts, sorry. If you're gluten intolerant, like true celiac, you're gonna have to go on a low, low gluten or at least gluten-free diet. Like there's some circumstances where you don't have much wiggle room. But outside of circumstances like that, you probably have a hell of a lot more wiggle room than you currently may believe. So that's why I always tell people, if there's something about your approach to diet or exercise, where if you found a magic genie and you could wish your way, it's like, I wish I didn't have to do X and still stay in shape, chances are very good. You don't have to do that. You don't have to do keto if you don't want to. You don't have to do intermittent fasting. If you don't like bananas, for example, there's no good reason you should be eating bananas, right? There's a million different ways we can accomplish everything. Don't force yourself to follow something. Again, there's that idea of, well, if it's hard, it must be effective. No, oftentimes things are less effective because it's hard. And especially when it comes to diet, because this whole diet thing, especially with diet and weight loss, is supposed to get easier over time. It's not supposed to be a challenge. It's not supposed to be something that's blood, sweat, and tears, and it's like, I'm being good this week. It should be something you eventually reach a point, you can do it without even thinking about it. It's like riding a bike. When I first learned how to ride a bike, a lot of focus, a lot of concentration, a lot of bloody knees, right? It was blood, sweat, and tears, quite literally, for me to ride a bike. Now I get on and I don't even have to think about it. I'm texting on my phone and riding while sipping a latte and stuff. I don't have to think about it. That's how we should be uh, addressing nutrition. It's not supposed to keep getting hard. It's supposed to be getting easier by addressing the freedoms that we have to do things that are best for us and making adjustments. I'm trying to get this question here. Matt, is bad... Uh, quad and back exercise when you have ATB. I'm sorry, I don't quite understand the, the question there. Please try to rephrase that a little bit. I want to make sure I understand that so I can give you a good answer. Flow into Freedom has had recently uh, varicose vein surgery. Oh, very, very interesting. Had experience with my clients who had it for starting to uh, train. Again, any tips about overcoming isometrics? Guess this would be a good start. Yeah, definitely, for sure. In all disclosure, like I re your guess is probably as good as mine. You probably know more about it now than I do because I don't have much experience working with people with varicose veins or had surgery for varicose veins. So I don't think I could give you a very valid and informed question about this, but the general things still probably apply. Uh, don't do anything that hurts. 
you know, if they're doing an exercise or in a, in a certain way, it's like hurting and stuff, stay away from that sort of thing. Ease into it, nice and gentle and easy going because you're probably going to have to kind of let the blood flow into those muscles be a bit of the limiting factor. Start nice and easy, ramp up gradually, and as above all, let the clients and yourself kind of dictate the pace of that progress. You don't need to necessarily push and push and push in order to uh, make gains. Just let yourself work with the body over time and let the body adapt to the training stimulus. Oh, question came right on up. Adela, hope I'm pronouncing that right. Hey, Matt, have you ever experienced an injury? How did you overcome it four weeks ago? I had a minor bicep tear, but now I'm fine. I'm in, I'm afraid to start doing pull-ups. Any tips? Oh yeah. Injury. I mean, <laughs> any, anyone who's done physical training long enough has plenty of injuries. I've had <laughs> injuries my, most of my entire life. Um, knees, especially uh, everybody's like, Oh yeah. Remember when you were young, you were bulletproof and your knees were great. And I'm like, no, <laughs> I've had basically major joint pain since I was 13. Uh, I've never been that strong, robust, youthful, can tackle the world kind of individual. I've always been bent, broken, and beat up in some way, shape, or form. Only now, ironically enough, I'm better than I ever have been uh, in my 40s. But anyway, uh, so pain, is general steps. One, get it looked at by a doctor so you know exactly what's going on. Uh, don't try to self-diagnose through the internet, especially if it's chronic and long lasting because you want someone to look at it and know exactly what's going on and tell you exactly how to fix it. Two, let pain be your guide. Don't do things that hurt. I always tell my clients, rule number one, we don't do things that hurt. Discomfort's fine, but we don't do things that hurt. Pain is mother nature's way of telling you you're screwing something up. Three, don't feel like you're quite out of the woods yet because there isn't so much pain right now. Uh, the threshold of damage that we require in order to feel pain is give or take about halfway. So when you heal enough that you don't have pain anymore, that doesn't mean you're fully healed. You still have more healing to do. So I would go not so much with the pull-ups, but start off with very gentle, nice and easy, like body weight rows on a set of rings or something. Gentle, nice and easy. You want to finish your workouts feeling like you've got plenty more in the tank. Like, oh, that was easy. That's exactly what you want to do because motion is lotion. That's going to help continue to strengthen that tendon that was probably a bit torn. And those things take a long time to heal. Uh, tendons uh, are unfortunately frustratingly slow to heal. So give yourself plenty of time. No need to jump into it. You're right to be a little nervous and afraid to jump right back into pull-ups. This is an interesting question. John Seth, hey Matt, you should review Pull-Up and Dip. It looks great for calisthenics. Is that a particular book or something? Um, I, Pull-Ups and Dips, I mean, those are like for upper body. That's like chocolate and peanut butter, man. That's a, as good as it gets. Those are fantastic exercises. That's why I wrote uh, the Triad Muscle Revolution. This is one of my first ever eBooks that you can still get for free over at reddeltaproject.com under the resources tab. It's three exercises. Three main exercises. If you ever came to me and said, I want to build muscle and strength and calisthenics, that's what I would recommend. Pull-ups, dips, and something else for the legs. But uh, if you're curious about that, read the ebook. It's a free download. I don't even want your email address. You just click on it and it's yours. Next question. Hey, Matthew, is it possible to fix right scapular, shoulder scapular winging with ring exercises? Uh, possibly, but it depends, again, not on the exercise, but how well you're doing the exercise. So winging is a uh, lack of proficiency in your ability to use your body. It's not about the exercise. Uh, now, of course, sometimes this winging is due to a nerve damage and your serratus anterior, uh, probably not the case, but I'm just putting it out there as something you may wanna get checked out. But uh, typically scapular control is to blame here. Our, we're not using our shoulder blades as need be. If you go and look at the Instagram tile that I put about this, um, this uh, live feed that I put on the RDP Instagram, you can see a little scapular winging on me on that, that god awful push up on the medicine ball where I'm doing all kinds of things wrong on it. Uh, scapular winging is a big thing I've had to struggle with. So, when we are doing our push ups, we want to make sure we're using our scaps a lot. We don't want them locked into any one position. So, generally, when you're in the, the top position, you want your shoulder blades up and apart. And when you come down, down and together. So, you want your shoulder blades moving a lot when you're doing your push-ups, and the winging means that you're putting force through that area of your body but you're not allowing the shoulder blade to actually move. 
Rings are great for it, but you could probably do the same thing with anything else. Always a big fan of those sorts of things. Oh, good. Thank you, John. Uh, pull up and dip is an indoor outdoor equipment uh, bar setup for those exercises. Cool. Um, if you can uh, send me a video or anything that you see referencing that sort of thing uh, or post it on Red Delta Projects uh, Instagram, uh, DM me or something. Love to learn more. But yeah, you can't go wrong with those exercises. They're like the big, big uh, movers, so to speak, when it comes to the body weight training. They're also the easiest to load. Uh, Steven's back again. Hey, Matt, I find it difficult not to oversimplify fitness. Do you have any tips? Don't worry too much about it right now. Uh, so if you're in this game long enough, you go through cycles of complexity and simplicity. Uh, I do this myself where you take uh, something like diet and uh, exercise and stuff and you're like, oh, it's real simple. You just do blah, blah, blah. It's just this and just that. And you go with that for a while, but then as you learn more, you get deeper underneath it and you're like, wow, this is way more complicated than I thought it was. Uh, this is way, way, way more, more under the surface than I thought. Like you can study push-ups for 50 years and still learn there's a lot more to it. And we used to do this drill in the martial arts uh, and during testings for belt ranks where an instructor would say, okay, sidekick. And they're like, okay, tell me everything you know about sidekick, every little thing. You only have 10 minutes. And we'd always think, 10 minutes? Dear God, how am I going to talk about a sidekick for 10 minutes? And it was a challenge to keep it to 10 minutes because there's so much involved in a potential basic exercise. So if you're feeling like you're simplifying things now, good, great. But you're probably going to complicate things when you get deeper under the surface. And then it's going to get simple again and then more complicated. And it's just going to be cyclical. So let it come in stride. Don't try to force it to be simple. Don't force it to be complicated let it come ebbs and flows. It's a seasonal thing, change to everything. Oh, good one here. Hey Matt, what do you think is the best way to fix anterior pelvic tilt? Yes, absolutely. That anterior pelvic tilt, as I was saying earlier, is a big issue when it comes to the lower back issues. Um, it's a tough thing to kind of uh, deal with because there's a lot of stuff going on. As many times you hear people talk about lower cross syndrome. And basically what we have, uh, contributing to that are tight hip flexors, weak abs, uh, non-existent or low activation glutes and hamstrings. So as a result, your pelvis is getting pulled into that pelvic tilt. So you got to stretch the uh, hip flexors, you got to strengthen the abs, you got to strengthen the hamstrings, and you got to get the glutes fired up and working as well. Uh, luckily, there is such an exercise that deals with all of those all at once, or at least it should, which of course is bridge work. Uh, when we do type of bridge exercises, we should be using our glutes and our hamstrings, stretching our hip flexors, and potentially using your abs too. A lot of people don't use their abs very much. And that gets a little bit more of even a posterior pelvic tilt. So it gets all of those things realigned. So that's why, again, I mentioned the bridging videos. If you just do bridging search on Red Delta Project's YouTube channel, you'll come up with some ideas there. It doesn't need to be a complicated thing. You don't need to be like contorting yourself or anything like that. Just simple hip bridges will uh, go with uh, that as well. Hey Matt, do you recommend ring pike push-up? Is normal pike push or ring pike push-up better for healthy shoulders? Yeah, you could go either way. The thing with the rings is it, it takes that stability thing into account and you can also, of course, rotate your hands, which I'm always a big fan of. I would say first though, do become more proficient with the pike push-up on the floor. Uh, on the floor or put your feet up on something like an ottoman or a chair, maybe get like a couple of yoga blocks and bring yourself down in between the yoga blocks. That'll get you used to the range of motion and it'll get you used to the amount of weight that you're putting on your hands. Because the big mistake a lot of people make with ring pike pushups is they do regular pike pushups and they're like, yeah, I got this, this is no problem. But when you do ring pike pushups, your feet are usually higher, there's more range of motion and there's a stability component. So you just went from fairly easy to a hell of a lot harder and it doesn't work out so well. So progress the ground-based pike push-up, first regular pike push-up, then elevate your feet, then elevate your hands so you can move in between it. Then once you've got a fairly good handle on that, don't worry like how many reps should I do? Just once you feel really comfortable with it, then try the ring version. And that way you've got a nice progression strategy rather than going from zero to 60 and hoping you don't fall on your head. But yeah, it definitely, I love 
love ring pike push-ups. Fantastic exercise. Uh, feels really good on the shoulders. And this is coming from a guy who's got a really wonky shoulder too. All right, just a couple more here to wrap it on up. I really appreciate everybody coming on here on your Saturday. I know you're all busy out there, but uh, I think uh, this is a good time. We've got far more people here, a lot of very good questions. We may keep this time or something like this in the foreseeable future. So uh, just get to a couple more questions here. Uh, Socrates of Athens. Very good. I like that uh, name. Hey, Matt, what are your thoughts on front lever rows? I supine rows without using legs for support. Very hard. <laughs> They're very, very, very difficult. Uh, they're certainly a very effective exercise if you can do it for sure. Um, I'm a big fan of trying full body weight rows uh, where you're in a tuck position though. Uh, you don't need to go in a full lever, of course. That's the hardest version. I mean, that's just like Captain America level strength, but uh, tucked knees tucked in, doing full body weight rows, that alone, that's still tough. But a fantastic exercise, again, because you get your body in between your hands. Not that most people have the strength to bring their hands up to a full straight bar, but uh, being able to rotate the hands in something like rings and stuff, fantastic uh, exercise. See Bradley dealing with some popping, feeling in the inside of the elbow when curling. Uh, yeah, very common. So a lot of times popping is, again, like I said, uh, stress is going into your joint and then being released out of it. So this is kind of halfway in between. We want our forces upon our body going through our joints. So oftentimes when we have popping, sometimes it's structural, like you, you have a joint that just doesn't line in the socket just right. You might have a tendon or something that's not uh, grooving along a, a, a skeletal groove just right. But a lot of times popping is because we have force building in the joint and then it's releasing uh, at some point in the range of motion. So it's building then releasing. So usually it means something else isn't engaged. Once again, uh, probably with, put, with curling, you're not getting your shoulder blades back. You don't have that scapular retraction. You're not packing your shoulders enough. And um, you've got a little bit of some rotation going on. Try doing this with a different tool and see if that matters. So if you're with like a curl bar, try a straight bar. If you're still getting it there, try it with dumbbells. Try it with a tricep rope or something like that. See if you can get that because that would indicate that, yeah, your body position, something's a little bit wonky with one of those. And again, kind of go with a contrast and comparison A-B testing. Like, okay, popping's there with straight bar, but not with tricep. Okay, so what are you doing with the tricep row, uh, curls that are different from the straight barbell curls? All right, one more. Big dog coming on in the house. Finish with the big dog. We let the big dog eat. Uh, ankle hurts when I do back lunges or reverse lunges. Ankles are tight. How do I loosen them? You're right on the right track there, big dog. Uh, but I would suggest don't step. So instead of lunges, you have a split squat. So you just keep your feet planted and then you just go up and down with that and keep most of your weight on your front leg as well. I'm assuming you're maybe talking back ankle. But um, the, the best way to improve mobility is to use strength exercises that require that mobility. So use the split squat, gentle, nice and easy. Don't go too fast and stuff. Maybe if you're using external loads and stuff, decrease that a lot because getting to a bigger range of motion is harder. Therefore, if you're overloading yourself, you're not gonna allow yourself to get into that big range. Your nervous system's not gonna allow you to do it. So try body weight and every single day. Every day, super deep split squats, 10, 15 on a side or so, and it'll help to loosen that ankle up. Hopefully that takes care of you. All right. So this was great, everybody. We had record number of attendants and stuff. So we may do this again next week here on Saturday. We usually do it during the week, but I think we got a lot better going on here. So as always, though, if you have questions, DM me uh, at red dot. Uh, delta dot project for the Instagram. If you have questions you want me to answer directly. And uh, also on the RDP Instagram is where I'll put up a tile of what the next live feed will entail, the topic, the time, and that sort of thing. And as always, the main podcast section of this, not the Q and A, but the main podcast is also available on your local podcast directory. So if you missed that, you can download that at your leisure. So thank you so much, everybody. Don't forget down below is all the links to my books and other resources that I recommend that helps to support the show. That's why I don't need to put on like, you know, crazy advertisements every five seconds on this and drive you crazy. So uh, check those out as well. So thanks so much, everybody. Talk to you next week. Till then be fit and live free.